bonjour, je m'appelle Nicole. Euh, Aujourd'hui, je vais vous parler à propos de mes expériences en apprenant le Python et le français en même temps. Je voulais présenter cette conf en français, mais présenter une conf est déjà assez difficile comme ça, ah, donc je continuerai en anglais. Ah, aussi, si vous voulez demander des questions à la fin, ah, s'il vous plaît, demandez-les en anglais. C'est plus facile pour moi comme ça. Ah, mais si vous voulez venir me trouver plus tard, on peut essayer de se parler en français. Pas de problème. So, that was an introduction to my French. Um, so, who am I? As you know already, my name's Nicole. Um, and you might be able to tell from my English accent, well, my English language accent, that I'm Australian. Um, but I live in the UK with my half French, half British husband. And we run a small web design and development agency there. Um, and we're actually about to start work with PeopleDoc, who are one of the sponsors here at PyConference. Um, so I've been learning French for about six years on and off. And my motivation for learning French was uh, because I wanted to speak to the grandparents of my husband who live here in France. Um, and for three of those years, I've also been learning Python. And um, my motivation for that was also very practical. I wanted to be able to uh, help in the business. We had more development work coming in, so I needed to be able to help out there. Um, and I also wanted to create an app, which is for um, inspiring and encouraging mentorship within technical communities. So the point of me being here today is to talk to you about those two learning experiences and what I think uh, the Python community can learn from the language learning community in terms of better helping new learners, beginner learners. Oh, this is not working. <laughs> I can't make my slide go. No. <sighs> okay. So the first point is to celebrate late adopters. So there's a widespread perception that in order to learn a language, you must start when you're a child, or that um, you need to become, if in order to become fluent, you must begin uh, from childhood. Now it's true that children have certain advantages in learning languages. So. The first thing is that they have a lot more time. So someone who's my age, I'm 30, um, who starts at five, even if they just do a couple of you know, lessons per week, they're going to have 25 years of experience by the time they get to my age, whereas I only have six. So that they're, they're gonna be ahead of me. And the second is that we tend to give children a really easy uh, run. So a five-year-old that can say what I just said at the beginning of this conference is obviously going to be much more impressive than a 30-year-old being able to say that because, you know, we think that the children can't do these kinds of things. Um, but adults actually have advantages too. So linguistic researchers have found that under controlled conditions, adults can be better at language learners. And that's largely because adults are able to draw on existing tangential knowledge. So in my example, um, I already know English. There's lots of common words and, and concepts between English and French. So I can draw on those concepts in order to um, progress my French learning. So this is really good news because there's lots of people who start learning languages as adults. Um, it's really, really common, and the adult learning community, the language learning community, is really, really big. Um, there are blogs and there are resources specifically targeted towards adult learners. Um, and through these, I saw a lot of people who were learning French, and I came to realize that if all these other people can learn a second language and they can speak a second language, then so can I, and I think that was a really motivating thing for me. So in the technical community, I think we also have a problem. I think there's a perception that to become a coding ninja, um, we must start from ch childhood, that you must have been born with a computer in front of you. Or at least that those who start coding when they're young 
uh, are always going to be in front of people who start coding a little bit later in life. Um, and while people who have been coding for a long time do have an advantage in time, adult learners who come to learn Python have other advantages because they're bringing knowledge from other fields. So why I think it's in, while I think it's important to uh, encourage that Python be taught at school and, and at university, etc., I also think that we need to highlight the experiences of adult learners, people who are coming to Python after having careers in other things, people who are coming from different fields, and people specifically who don't have computer science degrees. So for over a year now, the Django Girls blog have been fe featuring a uh, Django story. I'm there. I'm very proud to be there. Um, and this uh, blog highlights the achievements of women who work with Django. And of the women uh, profiled, lots of, lots of these women started coding when they were young, and lots of them do have computer science degrees. But there's also lots of women who, who don't, who started in another field and then came to Python, or Django in this case, uh, later in life. So you can see, this is a bit of a word map, you can see that there's teachers, engineers, people who have been interested in or have degrees in psychology and literature and business and music and all sorts of different things. And I think that specifically targeting and highlighting learners who have come from other fields after pursuing different careers is going to encourage and inspire adult learners. Um, and I think it's also going to improve the diversity of our community as well, because it will bring in new skills and new backgrounds and new knowledge bases that will, bring, that will make the whole uh, community stronger. So my second point of what the Python community can do to help new beginners that I learned from my language learning experience is to help break down motivation barriers. So my learning journey has been marked by these really intense periods of, of frequent activity, and then these large blocks of time when I've, I've done not very much. Um, and this partly had to do with the things that I was doing in my life, but it also had to do with my level of motivation. Um, my largest learning jumps in French happened when I could start to actually talk to people and make basic sentences. Um, during this time, it's been easy to stay motivated and keep learning because there's, there's a reward, there's an effort reward cycle going on. Um, uh, sorry, I've lost my spot. Now, the good thing is that Python uh, doesn't actually have this problem. Um, I think we're doing a good job at giving new learners instant gratification, which keeps learners motivated. So in a recent survey, this is a, a survey of English school children and their parents, and it revealed that 75% of primary school aged children would prefer to learn to code, and it was specifically Python, this, this survey, than learn to speak in French. Um, and I think the reason for that is not because French is awful. I think it's because um, it's easy to start making progress when, you, when you're starting out in, in programming. You know, you've got all these um, basic programs that you can create uh, to, to get motivated and stay motivated. Um, but the bad news is that the same survey revealed that as children got older, they lost interest in learning to code. Um, and I think that's partly because what happens is it's really exciting and they're creating things, you know, very simple pro programs, and then they sort of hit a barrier where it all starts to become quite hard and it's really difficult to stay motivated uh, in that kind of circumstances. So if I had to describe my own learning paths, this is what they'd look like, my very accurate and scientific graph. So this is French. So it starts off, and this is the motivation block. So it starts off really, really hard, and it's really hard for a long time because I can't do anything and say anything. And then as soon as I, I can start to say things, my, my learning experience kind of, it gets a lot easier. And then it's going back up at the end because at the moment I'm trying to learn conjugation and that's not much fun. <laughs> um, 
Um, and on the other hand, this is what I think my Python learning experience looks like, and I think that uh, maybe you can identify with this. At the beginning, it, it's, it's quite easy, you can get things to work, it's really exciting, and then you hit this. And for me, that was two things. It was time zones, and it was uh, deploying my Django project. So these were the two things that I really, really struggled with, and I lost a lot of time and a, and a lot of motivation um, at that point. So I think that, I mean, I did everything that you're supposed to do. I went on ISC, I asked questions, I read you, excuse me, I read tutorials, I Googled things, but I couldn't really get past this block there. And what I really needed was somebody to talk to and to, to tell me, you know, how time zones work and, and how I should be deploying my project. Um, and that leads me to my next point, which is encouraging mentorship. So I think people are often surprised when I explain to them that I've actually never taken a formal French lesson, but as you heard before, I can kind of get by saying a few things in French. And um, while I can attribute that partly to some good learning resources, um, the main reason that uh, I can kind of get by is because I have my husband, who's also my mentor. Um, so what did he do for me? He, first thing he did is he answered my difficult questions. Now, I'm not talking about questions like translation questions. Um, I can obviously get the answers to those online or in a book. He, he asked, answered my questions about the structure and the meaning of the French language. Um, the next thing he did was he corrected me when I was saying something wrong, which is often, and he focused particularly on my accent. Um, and he told me what I needed to improve, and he pointed me towards resources to help me. He even bought me a becherel. Um, <laughs> which I've, I've heard today is not the most popular book in France. Um, now, he didn't actually teach me French. I'm not going to give him the credit for teaching me French. I taught myself French. Um, but without his help, I would have been a lot further back or I would have given up uh, in my learning journey. So this is my proposal. Wouldn't it be amazing if every new Python developer had someone to answer their questions, not the simple stuff that you can find by Googling, but the really, really difficult stuff that you can't understand? Someone to review their code, and someone to help develop tailored learning plans specifically for them. I'm not talking here about a teacher. I'm talking about a mentor. And as a community, I think we would benefit immensely from setting up a formal mentorship system. Um, not only for new developers either, I think we could have a system where everyone was mentoring someone else. Um, so you're probably thinking, I've got enough to do keeping up with all the technology, I don't want to have another responsibility of mentoring another person, this sounds like a lot of work and I don't want to do it. But um, the thing about mentoring is that being a mentor is just as valuable as being mentored because you start to learn things and having to explain things, you start to learn things about the language that you didn't know before. And that was certainly the case with my husband uh, mentoring me in French. He had a lot of insights into the French and English languages and their relationship between each other because he was helping me. So I've been working on a small project called Connect. Um, and it's specifically to help facilitate mentorship. So if this is something you're interested, come and talk to me, maybe in French, later, and we can, we can talk about it together. So the next thing I want to talk about is immersing new learners. So in the language learning community, it's widely accepted the best way to learn a language is to be immersed in it. Um, and Often this is in the form of uh, comprehensive courses where you go to France and you, you, you do like, you know, 10 days of workshops and then you're immersed in the language. But sometimes it's just a matter of going to a place and speaking to people in your target language. Um, you're probably not surprised to hear that there's lots of words in my French vocabulary that I can't remember learning. Lots that I just picked up just by being sort of exposed to the language. The, the interesting thing is I might use a word 
or a phrase incorrectly for a while, and then after I'm exposed to it over and over again, I correct myself until eventually I'm saying it right in terms of meaning and almost right in, term, in terms of accent. So I think in our industry, we're uncomfortable with the notion of developers or beginner developers muddling through in the same way. We definitely don't like the idea of new developers taking code that they don't understand and using it in their projects. But when I was learning Python, I actually found the best way to learn was to copy code, put it in my project, get it to work. And then in refactoring it and reusing it, I actually started to understand what the code was doing. The problem, though, is that we write our documentation with the idea that, that understanding should always come before implementation. Uh, for this reason, our documentation often includes difficult explanation, but not very many examples. So I'd like to see, this is my call to action, I'd like to see more code samples in documentation. I'd like to be inundated, I'd like to be immersed in uh, code examples. I'd like to see examples of where a library's been used in another real project so that I can look at that and see how other developers have used it. And I'd like to see a little change in attitude. Um, and I think we should be giving beginners the, the room to implement something first and then understand it later. Because I think in reality, very few beginners are working on code bases that are uh, critical systems. It really doesn't matter for most beginners if there's a short period between implementing something and understanding something. So this is my final point. Um, I'm going to admit here that for the, the last, out of the last six years, I've, for the five of those years, I've been really, really shy about learning French, really embarrassed by it. I wouldn't speak to anyone in French because I was so afraid that I was going to make a mistake and look like an idiot. So this was single-handedly like the worst thing for me. It really, really held me back in terms of my learning. Um, and in January of this year, I made a New Year's resolution and I decided that I wasn't going to care anymore. I was going to talk to as many people in French as I could, and if they had a problem with it, it was their problem. I was going to be proud of what I'd learned and, and just sort of get on with it. So I decided to fake it till I make it. I became Nicole, not Nicole, and I imagined that I was French. That's my attire today. And this and this alone was actually proved to be the biggest improvement in my, in my knowledge. And again, I think that we have a similar problem in the Python or the technical community. I think that there's a lot of people that are afraid to ask questions because they're scared of looking like an idiot. Um, and they don't want to sound stupid. And I think they're afraid to ask for feedback on code or even show their code because they don't want to be given negative or unhelpful feedback. I think there's such a stigma around being a bad coder that some people are paralyzed by the idea of that label being applied to them. So I was working on my app for over a year before I actually showed anybody, pretty much for this reason. Um, and this was really stupid because I showed it at DjangoCon last year, or this year, sorry, and everyone thought my code was good and they wanted to help me and, and it, it really boosted my confidence and it helped me immensely. And if I had have just put that out there a year ago, a year before, I would have been much further along in my learning. So I think to help people get over these things, there's two things we can do. I think we need to encourage new coders to make mistakes. And I think we need to make failure a celebrated part of the language learning, I'm sorry, the Python learning process. Um, and I think we need more experienced uh, programmers to stand up and say, this is the time that I totally stuffed it up. And this is the time that I didn't understand what I was doing. Because if we can see other more experienced developers doing that, then beginners are going to see that failure is a natural part of the learning process. 
And the th second thing I think we can do is give better feedback. So I think we could develop some community guidelines about how to give feedback in a way that promotes kindness over judgment. Sometimes there's nothing more shattering than putting yourself out there and getting feedback that's, that's judgmental or given to you in a tone that's not helpful because even if the feedback is correct, the way that you are giving that feedback can be debilitating for the person receiving it. So in conclusion, number one was to celebrate new learners, oh sorry, celebrate late, late adapters, break down motivational barriers, encourage mentorship, and immerse new learners, and boost confidence. And I think if we can do all of this, um, we're going to really help new Pythonistas on their learning journey. Thank you. Merci. <laughs> Any questions? En anglais? <laughs> Please. Rémi? Oui, euh, merci beaucoup. <laughs> Dans Vra rien. <laughs> vraiment, c'est euh, très inspirant. Ça fait, euh, ça fait longtemps que je n'ai pas vu un talk qui m'a autant euh, motivé <laughs> à, <laughs> à être mentor. Bon, je, je fais un peu de Django Carrots aussi, mais. C'est merci, Paul. Voilà. <rire> D'accord, merci. Hi, uh, I like to say that uh, I found your talk very inspiring as well <laughs> because uh, uh, I'm, I find myself in the same situation as you. I started to learn uh, French uh, very recently as well as Python, and um. <laughs> I just uh, uh, like to know uh, when you show your learning curve. Yeah. Uh, I saw that at the beginning you had a, a hard time to learn French. Yeah. Uh, and I'd like to know if it's uh, really, if you find, uh, if you think that uh, you um, learn faster in case of, uh, I don't know if you were in a, in a French environment at that time or not, or you were? No, oh, okay. no. So you think that uh, if you had in, uh, in a French environment that yeah. forced you to speak, you think you learn uh, Faster? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that was what the point about immersion was. I, for most of the time when I was learning French, I was in Australia. So it's not like I could just pop over to France and be immersed in French language and culture. I had to go quite a way. So um, yeah, I think immersion is the most, one of the most important things. And that's why I was saying, giving more examples of code and immersing learners in the same way mm. would be helpful. There's a really interesting talk by Kathy Sierra um, about, it's called, I can't remember the exact name, but it's Creating Badass Developers. And she talks a lot about immersion within a technical concept. So if you're interested in that concept, she's got two really good talks. That's one of them. And I'd recommend that you have a look at that. Thank you. Uh, I have to say, uh, I'm a beginner since 10 years. Uh, I'm 25. Uh, I've tried a dozen of languages and learning a language is hard. There yeah. is a lack of beginner guys. Um, since 10 years I've tried many languages and I can do the basic in a terminal. But I'd like to try Mm, graphic interfaces, mm -hmm. and there is no guide, no help, mm, nothing. Doing terminal is boring. Yeah, I think this is. Uh, I think this is actually the study that I. I, the example that I showed you was uh, uh, primary school age children. And a lot of the time, primary school age children do things with. I can't remember the name of the language, but the little turtle. I can't remember the name, but they have graphical interfaces for learning how to code. And the question actually, the, the quote was a little bit misleading, but the question that they were asked was, would you rather learn to speak French or program a robot? And I mean, kids are going to answer, I want to program a robot, right? Because it's exciting. And I think that having more things that are going to uh, make things a lot easier and more exciting, like you said, yeah, is, it, is really important in the early stages. 
um, t today I I'm unable, for example, to try simple things like um, code um, uh, the petrol consumption of my car uh, <laughs> to to follow it. I have, a, I have an old car and uh, it's very expensive. Mm. And in console, it's boring. I like to have graphics and I can't do it in GTK, in Qt. Uh, there is no beginner guide. Uh, and when I search on the web, I just found, oh, yeah, look, you can do hello world. No, <laughs> that's not what I want I to think do. I think you've just created a new project for yourself, creating a, a GUI for people in your position, maybe, yeah. you know? I'd love to, to, to have more um, experienced programmers to um, write, create uh, documentation for beginners mm. and uh, what seems to be advanced programming and which is not, which is um, something that appears logical uh, every day when we use our computers we use it on a graphical interface, not terminal, except on Linux. But today, when you're interested in computers, um, the community, when you ask a question, a simple question is... Use the terminal. No, just Google it. Yeah. You don't know the answer, I, I will not answer your question. Google it. I, th I think this is... Coming back to one of my other points yeah. is where if you had a mentor, you it's, know... It's really easier. Yeah, because there are things that you can Google and find the answer to. But also I think the other thing is sometimes when you Google something, you get six different answers and you don't know which one's, not the right one, but the best one. And without someone who's there to say, well, you don't want to do it that way or you don't want to do it that way, then you ha don't have any guide. And I think that's what you're saying, having yeah. someone... And to help you. With different version of languages. Um, recently I've tried Python and I found a really interesting method uh, on learn Python the hard way. Uh, the guy has, has made it really interesting for adult beginners uh, in C. And Examples, yeah.
Yeah. I, th I think something I should announce that's kind of related to what you were saying is I'm involved in the redesign of PyPy. Um, we're going to be redesigning that and relaunching PyPy at the start of end of this year uh, to the start of next year. And um, one of the priorities that we've identified in that process is we're going to be rewriting, we're writing two tutorials for uh, beginners. So there's going to be one tutorial that's covering what a package is and how to install a package. Um, you know, for people who have never came, come across a package before in their life. And then another tutorial, step-by-step -step tutorial for how to package a package for PyPy. So that's kind of what you were saying. I mean, I know it's slightly different, but um, I think there are some efforts to try and make things more beginner-friendly. I think it depends generally on the uh, projects that you're looking at. I think the Django community is particularly good with their um, tutorial. That's how I learned Django. That was step-by-step -step tutorial, but I think you're right, there are some instances where the documentation could definitely be improved for beginners. Were there any other questions? No? Okay, merci.